Good morning. Good morning. That's all the police stand as you are able to sing praise to God with great of the Lord. Oh, yeah, I don't You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your praise your holy name, to experience your grace, to lift our hearts, lift our voices in recognition and a thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. You poured out your life for our sake, God, and may we pour out our hearts to you in this place, and may you be glorified and magnified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, welcome to worship, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good. It's like uh, Wizard of Oz, but for us, fortunately, our church is still standing, as I assume most of your homes are. I heard it was quite windy here on Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, so, yeah, you know, the A-frame helps keep the church stable. That's why we built it this way 60 plus years. And it helps the snowfall. Well, that too, yeah. of course. Yeah. It just falls right yeah. off the snow. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Um, Please do fill out your attendance cards. Uh, we'll collect those during our time of offering a somewhat abbreviated service this morning so that we can get right to the business of our annual congregational meeting. It's going to happen shortly after our worship time. Uh, we'll have a bit of time for donuts and coffee and then gather back into our sanctuary for our, uh, for our annual meeting. So I hope that you will all stick around for that because we need bodies in order to have a quorum, right? Because I'm not going to reschedule it. It's just not going to happen. We'll make things up if we have to. So. Just kidding. We would never do that. That would be bad. And my condolences to you, Green Bay Packer fans. I, it was a terrible, that was a horrible, it was terrible if you're a Packer fan. But Lindy's mother always had a good perspective on things like that. Think about how happy the Niners fans are. Yeah. Isn't that some consolation for them? I don't I mean, care about them. <laughs> I know, but there's a lot of people, a lot of people that are happy with the outcome of that game. It's not all. I now became a Rams fan. There you go. Oh, yay! So, 
And if we get through our meeting quickly enough, you can get home to the game, which starts at noon. We will do that. Uh, please join me uh, in the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast in the hope of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're looking up there. I'll find it. That's okay. We're not perfect with technology. Lindy and I discovered that last night as we went to go uh, see the musical My Fair Lady at Seegerstrom. And we drove in, parked, walked up to the wheel call window, and as she was about to get the tickets, they went, oh, show's canceled. <gasps> Technical problems. You imagine their budget's probably much greater than ours, <laughs> and their technology much better than ours. But it's not perfect, so and neither are we. Blame it on the wind. Yeah, it's okay. We pray it, so. Scriptures. Well, I can't read it now because he's doing it. It's not. There we go. Oh, you did? Okay. Okay, then I'll get up. We good to go now? We'll find out. The first reading this morning comes from Nehemiah, the eighth chapter. All the people of Israel. <laughs> All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. When Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with their interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing was prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here is the first reading. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single mem member, where would 
the body be. As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. And our less respectable members are treated with great respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, power then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts. Here is the second reading. Thank you, God. You may rise with the gospel. <laughs> Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues, and he was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, last week uh, in my sermon I spoke about the glory of God. The glory of God revealed in Christ. And there's lots and lots of layers to all of this stuff that we come to, that we understand or don't understand about, about God and the Spirit and Jesus and Trinity and all of that. But one of the aspects of God's glory, uh, as I kind of explained it last week, of that's something that's worthy to be praised, something that's worthy to be lifted up or admired, some great accomplishment. It doesn't quite apply to God, but part of God's glory is revealed in some of the characteristics and the nature of who God is. And some of those things that we come to know about who God is. And one of those characteristics of God that we speak about occasionally, that's one of those kind of churchy words, is the word faithfulness. Um, uh, we praise and thank God for his faithfulness. So what is faithfulness? I feel like I'm teaching a class on theology over the last couple Sundays, but nevertheless, uh, what is faithfulness? And, and that word may bring to mind to you something along the lines of trustworthiness or um, uh, someone you can count on. Or We have people in our life that we consider to be faithful, right? A friend that you call or a family member that's always there regardless of the circumstance or the situation. Even better, when things aren't going great, you need those faithful friends or family members that you can call in the middle of the night 
or at the last minute and ask a favor of them and you know they're going to show up, right? I mean, that's faithfulness. Um, in, in human terms, it's a very valuable thing. It's something that we admire in folks and, and frankly, it's something that maybe some of us actually strive for. We all have flaky friends. Those are the ones that you call and say they're going to pick you up at the airport and they don't show up and you never call them again. You, you only get one chance for some of those things. Um, but we stick close to those people because they're important to us. And, and we always need sort of a helping hand. Well, at some point in our life, we're going to need a helping hand in some way. But the faithfulness of God is completely different, not surprising, than how we see the faithfulness in people. This is one of our problems. Well, I'll just speak for myself. One of my problems, maybe you're all different, that we tend to de define our relationship with God in terms of our relationships with and experiences with human people in this world. It's not. None of you are like a God. Um, neither am I. You all should be very happy about that. Um, the faithfulness of God is something completely and utterly different. When we are the faithful friend or family member of somebody, we don't do it completely without some benefit for ourselves. It's not completely idealistic or holistic in the way that we do things. We benefit from those things, right? Bless you. Thank you. It's always good to sneeze in church, because then you get blessed and it's extra special. Um, <laughs> we may think that the acts of faithfulness are completely selfless, but the reality is they're not. They help us to maintain friendships. Some of us might think a tit for tat that one day you might remember that time that I helped you move. And then when I need your help, I can call in that favor. Um, we may be mostly selfless, but in every single one of us, because of our nature of being imperfect human beings, there is a selfish component to everything that we do. Even if it's just a tiny bit selfish. Being faithful to somebody helps us to maintain a friendship, right? That's a benefit to us. We like to have people in our lives that are friends and stay close to folks. So there is a motive for us to do all those things. With God, faithfulness has nothing to do with that. God has nothing to gain from us. God has nothing to benefit. The benefits in no way by being faithful to anybody or anything. God does it simply because God is faithful. And the story that, that Vicki read from the book of Nehemiah, raise your hand if you knew there was a book called Nehemiah in the Bible. <laughs> it's one of those books that we, uh, we read once a, every three years in church as part of the lecture. And other than that, it gets completely ignored. Uh, but it's an important book. Um, as opposed to most of the Old Testament prophetic books, it's one of the two books that takes place after the return of the Israelites from exile in Babylon. There's some of, uh, from a chronological perspective, some of the, uh, they, they detail and narrate some of the last events in the Old Testament era, before the silent period of the last 400 years before Christ. Uh, Nehemiah was, as it said in that reading, the governor, and Ezra, his partner, was the priest, that uh, when Darius, the um, um, uh, Persian king, returned, not Darius, I forget his name, the Persian king sent the Israelites back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to re rebuild their city, to rebuild their way of life. And he supported it, and he, and he provided the funds for it, and protection, uh, sending back the people who had been exiled back into Jerusalem to do all of this, to restore the people. The people that went back were very, very unlikely alive when they were exiled. They were exiled for a period of uh, 70 years or so. Uh, in biblical terms, that's almost two generations. So the people that went that were any older than a, you know, five, ten years old. There may have been some 90-year-olds in that group that went, but almost none of them had, would have remembered what life was like in Jerusalem. It would have been something completely foreign to them and something that the old people told stories about. Oy vey, if you only could have seen the temple. It was so magnificent. And 
Our worship and our way of life was so much different. You think about a 70 year period and how life changes. Um, it's hard to, to think back that far, but think about it from the perspective of the people who had not ever known that. All of those that were born in Babylon. And so when they're going back to the temple, they're encouraged by Nehemiah and Ezra to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the temple and to kind of restart the way of worship, which if that was never a part of your life. They're like, why are we doing this? I mean, it seems kind of pointless. And it's a lot of work. Building walls without machinery, without cranes and, and tractors, and that would have been really, really hard work. Plus, you add in the fact that the surrounding nations and the enemies, the old enemies of Israel, who were super stoked that Israel was destroyed by the Babylonians, when they come back, they're just harassing them nonstop and making it even harder for them to do what they were being encouraged to do. And uh, we're being, well, fulfillment of prophecy for what God had said would take place. It was really, really hard. That's just a really general uh, idea of what's taking place. But the particular story that we read was one about the book of the law, the book of Moses. So they were all gathered together. When they were trying to do all this rebuilding stuff, they, these were people that were not familiar with the practice of the law, at least in terms of how it took place in the life in Jerusalem, which was centered around worship, sacrifice, and all of the things that took place in the temple. That no longer took place. And over the course of those 70 years, it was like, eh, the law. They kind of forgot about it. They weren't practicing it because they were living amongst a foreign people in an unclean land. It was impossible to do that. Um, so it just kind of fell by the wayside. And as they came back, it occurred at some point to the priest and to the governor, these two, that you know what we need to do to inspire the people is to, is to break out of the book of the law. It's to remind them of who we are and who God is and of the promises of God. And so they had a copy of the Torah. They had a copy of the book of Moses, the law. And, and they gathered all of the people together to read and hear the stories of Moses and of the book of the law and of God and of the covenant. And a lot of things must have come to mind for them. First, the nostalgia of what had taken place and that all of those people that had since died had told them about the way of life in Jerusalem and perhaps told them about who this God was, told them stories from the prophets, told them the story of Abraham, told them the story of Noah and his ark, of Adam and Eve and King David and his descendants, and over and over again. And one of the things that must have come to mind to them was Goodness gracious, we were exiled into Babylon because our people, our leaders, our kings violated the law of Moses. They broke the covenant. And the covenant is the basis of all, the basis of the relationship that God has with his people always. Starting with Noah and going through Abraham uh, and going through Moses and going through David some other minor sort of covenants of God saying I'm going to be your God and you'll be my people and here are some of the requirements of that you are going to be on the receiving end of incredible blessings by having me as your God I am the great and almighty and one and only God more powerful than all other non-existent gods whatever um, you'll benefit by this me being your God, and it's unmitigated grace that I'm offering this to you, and here's a way that you should, you know, sort of behave and respect what I've done for you. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences. That was part of the covenant with Moses. Um, in some ways, that was part of the covenant that God made with David, that there would always be a king on the throne ruling over Israel, but if they decided that they didn't need to obey the book of the law, there was going to be consequences and discipline. And so the people probably heard, wow, we got sent to Babylon and our, our city was destroyed, not because God gave up on us or put on his promises, but because of the things that we did. But also hearing about 
the great things that God had done in the reading of those, in the reading of that book of the law, about the Exodus, about the faithfulness of God through all generations of the people of Israel, that when God makes a promise, it will never be broken. And if something goes awry, and doesn't happen according to your standards, it's not because God has forgotten, or God has forsaken, or God has given up, or God has changed his mind. It may be because the people quit on their end. They decided to worship other gods. They decided to forsake God. They gave up on justice and equity and compassion and mercy and grace and hospitality and all of the things that God stood for that they were to represent to the rest of the world. And as a result of that, discipline was going to come where God was going to withhold the benefits of being in a covenant with him because they weren't holding up their end of the bargain. Sometimes it's just the chaos of life. Sometimes there are circumstances that take place that have nothing to do with people being unfaithful and certainly nothing to do with God being unfaithful. But say again you had a friend who was going to pick you up at the airport and you know on the way to the airport their engine blew up in Pasadena on their way. Well, the problem wasn't with them. The problem was something blew up and they had no control over it. And the people are hearing about the faithfulness of God. And that is literally what the entire, one of the things that the entire Old Testament is about. God's saying, I'm going to do this. God does that. And people say, we're going to do this. And then they don't. And God says, well, I'm not going to do that. But over and over again, God doing things on behalf of the people, out of his generosity, out of his grace, to the benefit of those people, not because God needs to be praised or given credit for it. That's not who God is. God is all of those things, whether we acknowledge or praise or think about God in those terms. But it is a story after story after story of God always being there, of God remembering his promises. And as the people in Nehemiah's day heard about what was taking place in what was going to be happening in their midst. That God was restoring them. God was bringing them back. God was fulfilling the prophecies that had been spoken by the people, by the prophets of their day, by the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs, who at the end of their books were giving hope to people who were living in Babylon, saying, God's going to do this because of who God is. And now they're hearing it. Now they're living it. Now they're experiencing it. They're living in the faithfulness of God. And their hearts were lifted up. And they fell on their faces and worshipped God because they recognized the faithfulness of God and how blessed they were. The prophets had spoken for God to the people and it was coming true. And it was coming true in their midst. That's what prophets do. That's what prophets did. And God proves his faithfulness to people through the fulfillment of those prophecies. And that's what Jesus was talking about in that story in Luke. As he stood up in the synagogue, in this epiphany moment for those people at that time in Luke's gospel, immediately after his temptation in the desert, this is Luke recording his first not miracle, but his first revelation of him being God. He was fulfilling a prophecy, a messianic prophecy. And that's what he told the people when he said, what you're hearing me read, I am that person. I am the anointed one. I am the one who is going to liberate, to give sight to the blind, to release the captives, to break the chains of the oppressors. And at first, the people were like, yay! I think next week's gospel will tell a different story. I'm pretty sure our follow-up to this is the remainder of that story because it cut off in the middle of it. 
Jesus was an example of God's faithfulness because throughout the time, throughout the Old Testament, from the time of the monarchs, especially from the time of King David and onward, he had promised he was going to send him a king. And he was going to be one that was going to be from David's line. And he would sit on the throne and reign for all eternity. And it was taking place. It was happening right in their midst as they experienced Jesus standing up and reading this. The problem was their expectations. What they wanted God to do. Because one of the aspects of the faithfulness of God is not that he does what we want him to do. God is the sovereign God. God does what God's going to do and is unchanging. And that's what makes God perfectly faithful. If something happens in our life or in our world or doesn't meet our expectations, it's not because God failed us. It's because of a number of things. We misunderstood, we misinterpreted, we had false expectations. We believed that something was going to take place that we were never promised. And part of the faithfulness of God is you have to think about what has he promised to us? What has God said is going to take place? What are the expectations that we can have? Not that we'll always get what we want. Somebody wrote a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not who God is, and I've said this a number of times. If it was, that's the way that the relationship between us and God worked, that we always got what we wanted. If we just prayed in Jesus' name for whatever, that we would get it, then God's no longer God. God is our servant. He is our slave. He is our genie. He's our Santa Claus. He is not our God. It's sometimes just this world and the chaos that we live in that brings those very difficult moments in our life and the struggles that we face. It's not a result of God's failures. It's a result of living in a broken world. What God promises us are things like salvation and his faithfulness shown to us on the cross exemplifies that. He promises us joy in terms of our relationship with God, that being our strength as it was written in the prophet, by the prophet Nehemiah. He promises us peace. And he promises us hope. But he also promises that in this life we will face trials. Jesus said that. It came from his very own lips. In this life, you will face trials. But he also said, do not fear, for I have overcome the world. The faithfulness of God has proven to us through the prophets, through the writings of Scripture, and most definitely through the fulfillment of a prophecy through Jesus Christ and the promised Messiah, that faithfulness becomes a stronghold for us, becomes that rock on which we stand. Because nothing else in this world can be counted on. They say death and taxes. Death, yes. Not so sure about taxes. <laughs> God is the only thing that is 100% faithful in everything. And he is the stronghold. He is what we hold fast to in the midst of a chaotic world that we live in. And imagine a world without that. Without God having proven himself faithful over and over and over and over again. To always be there. To always be present to be faithful in his love and his grace and the full measure of joy and peace and hope and all of those things. That's who God is as a faithful God. Dependable. 100% of the time. Not our gene, but our God. And the one to whom we cling when all else fails. Praise be to God that he is faithful in all things, in all times, and in all places. And then when he says he's coming back again, hallelujah, praise Jesus. He could come back today. I'd be okay with that. Amen. Amen.
breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. silently in our minds now. God of grace. Hear our prayer. And Lord, I pray for the church, for the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, for us to be unified, for us to be as one as Paul wrote in that letter to the Corinthians that we might use our gifts collectively for the good of all people in this world. Continue to guide and lead 
those you have called as pastors and bishops and laypersons in our churches, as folks in various parts of this world and their churches are gathering on this day and the Sundays to come to uh, hold their annual congregational meetings, we pray for guidance and wisdom in the decisions that are made, that they all be made for the sake of your glory. And God, thank you for the privilege of allowing us to be your witnesses. Inspire us to be faithful as you are faithful to us. God of grace. Give our prayer. And Lord, there are many unspoken prayers and things in our hearts and in our minds that we struggle with, whatever they might be. And God, we trust in your faithfulness and, and your power to know what those things are. And we offer them to you. Uh, because to whom else can we turn? So for those unspoken prayers, uh, we give them to you. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please kind of stay where you are and share peace with each other. Peace be with you. And so I invite you to join me as we pray over our offering. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, and maker of all things, through your greatness to have blessed us in these gifts, our selves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered, in feeding the world with your love. The one who gives us for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is us right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. He took a loaf of bread. And he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they finished the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also in remembrance of me. Remembering Jesus and the bread and the wine, Let's pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, our power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The gifts of God for you, the people of God.
stand as you are able to receive the blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you forever in his grace. Amen. 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 Announcements. Sit. Uh, just, of course, the meeting right after this uh, service is taking place in here, so please stick around for that. Um, some people news. Uh, most of you, or at least a lot of you know, that Carolyn uh, Wendell went into the uh, emergency room last Monday night, Monday evening, Tuesday morning early, and was in ICU, was pretty critical with sepsis. Well, last I heard that she was possibly going home yesterday. She went home. She is home. But she is still on medication to fight the infection that she has. And then there's some other medical issues they're going to attend to after the fact. But praise God that she is home, uh, but still needs our prayers because there's still quite a few. There's still a bit to go. Um, and uh, some, well, <clears throat> sad news. Uh, I got a call this morning from Rick Damiani. And his wife, Linda, is in critical condition and not expected to survive. Oh, um, so I believe her death, based on what he said, is fairly imminent. Um, so, not didn't get necessarily a cause or whatever. I think it's just these bodies aren't meant to last forever. Her health started to decline pretty rapidly right around Christmas. So, uh, keep Rick and his family, and certainly, uh, well, we know what's happening with what's going to happen with Linda because of God's faithfulness. So that's. Uh, Death is always worst for the living. So just pray for those family members. And at some point, there'll be a service here, a, a celebration of life for Linda uh, here in this sanctuary. So other than that, I don't know that I have any other news. There's annual reports in the back. Um, and we'll have donuts and coffee on the patio while we get things set up for our meeting. So that's it. Lots of, go ahead. Please stand again. We're doing the liturgical Olympics. We'll be up and down and up and down. It's good for you around quads. Different quads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and in all things fill you with his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship here is ended. Now our worship is Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.